Well, well, well. The dream we talked about yesterday just came true. SpaceX's Ship 25 and Booster 9 pair is now fully stacked again. Though it's not the first time, it's never going to get boring when huge mechanical chopsticks pick up a humongous spacecraft and plant it on the even more ginormous first stage. And the whole process happened in just around 90 minutes. Weighing 100 tons or more at 9 meters in width and about 50 meters in height, the Starship was slowly lifted somewhere around 80 meters meters off the ground, translated over to Booster 9, and lowered on top of the 71 meter tall first stage. After nearly an hour of robotically tweaking their positions, the two Starship stages were finally secured together. Around two hours later, Starship's quick disconnect performed what looks like a full speed retract, including some flappy door action. I just hope that in the future, we'll see a full stack wet dress rehearsal. The prototypes will be simultaneously loaded with around 5,000 tons of liquid oxygen and methane propellant, and then will be ran through a launch countdown. Diverging just before ignition and liftoff, a wet dress rehearsal is meant to be more or less identical to a launch attempt. I, along with others, always love to see a wet dress rehearsal. With them, it's always a great way to check processes and operations and tweak the data collected each time. It also shows outward that they are ready to go. If the wet dress rehearsal goes to plan, SpaceX will then attempt to simultaneously ignite all 33 of the Raptor engines installed on Super Heavy B9. SpaceX will be pushing the envelope by several measures, and success is far from guaranteed. It's unclear if SpaceX will immediately attempt a full wet dress rehearsal or a 33 engine static fire. At a minimum, assuming WDR testing is completed without major issues, SpaceX will likely attempt at least one or more interim static fires with fewer than 33 engines before attempting the first full test. After that, they will still need to do another short D-stack to arm the FTS, but that is usually very close to the launch date. Regardless, there's no concern about that. Starship can be stacked and D-stacked at will multiple times easily. The design concept of it and Mechazilla is incredibly different from normal rockets. Thanks to their sturdy connection to a tower with a foundation sunk deep into the Boca Chica wetlands and a design that foregoes a hanging hook or jig for giant arms, Mechazilla is far less sensitive to winds than the immense crane otherwise required to stack Starship on top of Super Heavy. Sitting a stone's throw away from the Gulf of Mexico, storms and high winds are not exactly uncommon. No one else thought of anything close to Mechazilla, probably because they didn't consider such a launch cadence for a large vertical integrated rocket. While hardware challenges continue to trump paperwork, an FAA launch license is another significant hurdle standing between SpaceX and Starship's orbital launch debut. SpaceX and the FAA are in the middle of hammering out the details of such a license, which is partially contingent upon the completion of dozens of mitigation measures. In order to receive launch approval, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, or the FWS, must complete its investigation into the environmental impact of the Starbase launch operations. Because Starship's unprecedented size elevates the risk it could pose to local residents, it's likely that the license is also contingent upon results from ground tests and will be one of the last gates to be lifted. But back to Starbase, the newly arrived S-27 aft section was attached to the load spreader and then placed inside the nose cone testing structure at Massey's site which is pretty odd. The situation, not the Massey's testing facility. While the purpose of the test is still unclear, SpaceX may be thinking of routing airflow through the engine bay during re-entry. That might put a lot of torque on the bottom of a craft. Let us know what you think about this in the comments section down below. Next up, Soyuz finally returned to the ISS crew after a record-setting stay. Specifically, a Soyuz capsule landed in Kazakhstan on September 27th, returning two Russians and one American from the International Space Station after more than a year in orbit. The Soyuz MS-23 spacecraft landed in its designated landing zone in Kazakhstan at 7.17 a.m. Eastern. The spacecraft had undocked from the station's Prykol module at 3.54 a.m. Eastern. On board, the Soyuz were Roscosmos cosmonaut Sergei Prokopiev and Dmitry Pedelin, and NASA astronaut Frank Rubio. They launched to the station last September on the Soyuz MS-22 spacecraft for what was originally planned to be a typical six-month stay. Those plans changed, however, when the Soyuz MS-22 spacecraft suffered a coolant leak in December. NASA and Roscosmos decided weeks later to not use that spacecraft to bring back the crew, launching an uncrewed Soyuz MS-23 in February to take its place. The crew who were to fly to the station on Soyuz MS-23 in March 
Ole Kononenko, Nikolai Chubb, and Laurel O'Hara were bumped to Soyuz MS-24, which launched to the station on September 15th. NASA and Roscosmos extended the stay of Procopia, Petalin, and Rubio by six months. The three spent 371 days in space, the third longest spaceflight after the 438 days spent by Valery Polyakov in 1994 and 95, and 380 days spent by Sergei Avdiyev in 98 and 99, both on the Mir space station. The three set the record for the longest stay on the ISS. Rubio also set the record for the longest single spaceflight by an American, breaking the mark of 355 days set by Mark Vandehey in 2021 and 2022. In a call with reporters from the ISS on September 19th, Rubio admitted he would not have signed up for a year in space if offered in advance. If they had asked me up front before you start training, I probably would have declined, and that's only because of family. However, he said that once he started training, he was committed to the mission regardless of its length. Ultimately, that's our job, and we have to get the mission done. He said the hardest point in the mission was when his mission was extended by six months. That decision really took a couple of months, he said, as NASA and Roscosmos evaluated the options, giving him and his family the ability to prepare for that extension. Although it was difficult, honestly, I had already come to terms with it. And for all of us space fans, we are so glad that his journey has come to an end, and he is now safe with his family once more. Last but not least, the FAA announced on September 26th that it had closed the mishap investigation into a failed launch by Blue Origin's New Shepard vehicle more than a year ago, but said the vehicle is not yet cleared to resume flights. In its statement, the FAA said it identified 21 corrective actions that Blue Origin is required to complete to prevent the mishap from happening again. The agency did not enumerate the actions, but said they included a redesign of engine and nozzle components to improve its structure performance as well as organizational changes. Closing the investigation does not itself allow the company to resume New Shepard flights. The company must at a minimum demonstrate to the FAA it has implemented the recommendations related to public safety before the agency will issue a modified launch license. The FAA declined to say how many of the 21 corrective actions are linked to public safety. Blue Origin provided no additional details about the efforts to implement those corrective actions. We've received the FAA's letter and plan to fly soon, a company spokesperson said after the release of the FAA statement. The company offered a similar timeline when it released the outcome of its investigation on March 24th. Blue Origin expects to return to flight soon with a reflight of the NS-23 payloads, the company then said. Bob Smith, chief executive of Blue Origin, said at a conference on June 6th that the company was dotting the I's and crossing the T's with the FAA on its plans to return to flight. New Shepard, from that standpoint, should be ready to go fly within the next few weeks, he said then. New Shepard has not flown since the September 12th, 2022 mishap. The company announced September 25th that Smith would step down as chief executive of the company in early December to be replaced by Amazon executive Dave Limp. And that's about it for today's episode, everybody. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to support our channel and get access to exclusive content, please consider becoming a patron by clicking the link in the description below. We appreciate your generosity and your passion for space exploration. As always, this is Kevin from Great SpaceX, and until next time, keep looking up.